Oxford. Uh, it's called the Andrew Wiles Building because the money came from the place, Mr. and Mrs. Clay, and they wanted that name. And then, rather embarrassingly, we then hired Andrew Wiles a couple of years later. <laughs> so his office is sort of here, and my office is sort of here. They, they wanted to call it the Trefethen Building, but I refused. <laughs> uh, so, roughly speaking, I a little embarrassing, it wasn't supposed to be this way, but essentially it's pure mathematics and applied mathematics. Um, both big, it's a big part. Um, Oxford's a neat place. I'm not English, I'm American, but uh, it's a very happy, exciting environment to be in. Hey, raise your hand if you've been to Oxford. Oh, okay. Right, so uh, the talk is about uh, another English topic, uh, the Faraday cage. Um, so, one more, I won't do this all the time, but raise your hand if you've heard of the Faraday cage. My <laughs> thoughts are right. So, this is a famous idea. And, um, like all of these famous ideas, you would assume that everything is known about it. And, of course, the theme of the talk is that that's not true. Let me run you through the basic idea. So, um, in fact, I'll use the board a little bit. So, imagine you have a a metal, a conductor, a shell. So it's, it's a shell with an inside interior. If this three-dimensional picture, it's a two-dimensional picture. It could be three D, but I think it's two D. I'm working up to three D, but I'm not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> so just imagine a two D shell, if you like. Um, if it's a conducting shell, we're thinking of an electrostatic problem, a harmonic function. So if the I'm forgetting what are you, U or phi at the talk, I think it's U. Imagine that you have a conducting shell, then the voltage on the shell will be constant, and so therefore inside it will also be the same thing, which means the gradient will be zero. So inside a metal shell, there's no electric field, right? Um, so you're safe inside an airplane, more or less, from lightning, more or less. Uh, and that observation more or less goes back to Ben Franklin, but then Faraday went a little further, and he observed that it works pretty well even if the shell is a bunch of wires rather than a continuous shell. So in 3D, you imagine some kind of mesh, if you like, but in 2D, you imagine a bunch of wires which are connected to each other. So these are conducting wires, maybe it's a cross-section. So these are things that have the same voltage. And what Faraday observed is that inside this cage, he wouldn't have used this notation, but inside this cage, the gradient is zero. So how do you say that just mathematically in terms of functions? Well, we're going to, that's what the target voltage and all that. Oh, oh, sorry, U is a scalar harmonic function. Um, U is the voltage. U is the voltage. Yeah, mu naught is the value is constant. Then. U is a constant value on the on all the box. So, so this is a dear slay boundary condition for a uh, <laughs> thing he wants to know about the case of the dotted. The, the, the case of the dots. So U is constant on all the dots. Can let me go on. <laughs> um, I guess the only thing I haven't mentioned is that this effect is very important in the practical world in all sorts of places. Um, for example, the microwave oven is a great example. Um, you've all noticed that the front door of the microwave oven has a screen on it with little holes. And the point of this screen is that the microwaves can't get out because they have a big wavelength, and the light can 
can get out because it has a small way through. So you can see the food, but you don't get cooked while you are. So that's very important. But also all over the place. This kind of thing is used in all sorts of contexts, both static and uh, dynamic. Um, for shielding electric circuits, and in both directions. Sometimes, like the microwave, you have something going on inside that you want to don't that shouldn't disturb the outside. Other times, you have things on the outside and you want to be shielded from them. So we all know this idea of electric shield. Um, science museums like to do dramatic, nonlinear versions of this. This is from the Museum of Science in Boston. On the web, you can find lots of pictures if you Google you know, Faraday cave images. Okay, so let me tell you why I got interested. Um, and we're going to come back to your question of exactly what this picture means. But I got interested because of a problem that really involves points. Suppose you really have points which are equally spaced along a circle, and you want to do an integral of an analytic function along that circle. Well, if you sample that analytic function at equally spaced points, and then do the obvious trapezoidal rule approximation of the integral, that's exponentially accurate. So for an analytic integrand, you get exponential convergence as you take more and more points. This is an incredibly useful fact in numerical computation. In fact, this is the way Taylor coefficients are always computed. If you have a function, you know, f of z, and you want to compute its Taylor coefficients at the origin, how do you do it? Well, you put a circle around the origin, and you do contour integrals by sampling in equally spaced points. So it's a workhorse of computational complex analysis. That's easy. The mathematical analysis of this, I'm not going to talk about it, but it's very easy to prove that for an analytic function, you get geometric exponential conversion. And I've been very interested in that for years, and in fact, uh, Andre Weidemann and I um, have a paper that is in the current issue of Science Review, which we worked on for eight years, it's the biggest paper I've ever written. It's like 75 pages, um, all reviewing the trapezoidal rule in this context of exponential conversion. So I got interested with this analogy. I figured to myself, the trapezoidal rule is easy. It gets analytic functions. Now, there's this thing called the Faraday cage, right? And it's got wires. And we all know that it shields the inside from the outside incredibly well, it's got to be the same effect. It's got to be the same mathematics somehow. Because if you think of an electrostatic function, a harmonic function, well, that's, you know, that's the real part of an analytic function. We're in the very same set of ideas. I thought, this must be what's going on with the Faraday cage. And in fact, in the early version of the paper, we had a section on the Faraday cage. Uh, and the referee pointed out that it didn't really make sense, and the referee was right, and he removed that section. Um, and so this talk is the first talk I've given on this subject since we figured it out. So <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> um, okay, so we had this idea that we have an easy problem, which should be a good analogy for a very important practical problem. So then what you do, you figure, right, you just look up the Faraday cage. It's got to be in all the books, right? So what's the standard analysis? It must be in lots of physics and engineering books, right? Um, well, actually, no, it's not in the books. Um, you won't believe me. I'll tell you this, you won't believe me. You all have electromagnetic books on your shelves, maybe. You all think, hey, he's crazy. It's in my book. You go look. You'll be amazed how little there is. Um, there may be a remark that Faraday cages work. But you look for an equation. Um, now, of course, I can't say there's no literature. There's always a literature on something, and somewhere out there, maybe all the answers are known. But what we're sure of like, is that the answers are not right. Sorry. Like in the works of Onslaughter, uh, you have all these notes. Oh, Bart Onslaughter. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, it could be there. It could be there. <laughs> so, um, I won't embarrass anybody by saying who we've asked, but we have asked a lot of very senior, famous people. Um, and they all know the answer, um, and the answers they give you are all different. It's just amazing. Um, so they all say it's obvious for the following reason, but the reasons are different. It's just great. Um, okay, so the talk is uh, about the 
clean case of electrostatic harmonic function. So when you talk about wave, you know, electromagnetic wave, that's more common. Feynman is one of the interesting ones. So when I was talking to a professor at Oxford, he said, no problem, it's in Feynman's lecture notes. Um, sure enough, there is a page, two pages in Feynman's lecture notes, which basically answers the question, but it's wrong. It's really, it really is wrong. And um, you, you, you know, they say about Feynman that you know, you, at the end of the lecture, you feel you understand everything, and then an hour later, you, you doesn't quite fit together. Well, this perfectly fits that stereotype. Um, I read this and I think, oh, too bad, somebody else has done it. But the more you read it, the, the more wrong it is. So, um, first of all, Feynman assumes that the wires are of infinitesimal radius, which, of course, I also assume. But, you know, if you know any, if you really think about harmonic functions, you can't have voltages on infinitesimal radii. You can't have a Dirichlet boundary condition at a point. It has to be on a set of positive capacitors. So if you're talking about harmonic function, it's perfectly okay to specify a value on a circle of positive radius. You can't specify a value at a point. It just doesn't make sense mathematically. You can put a charge at a point, but you can't put a potential. What about this Shannon sampling of Hardy spaces on the circle? Well, that's, that's close to the trapezoidal rule. Um, that's not a potential example. <laughs> I'm getting impatient for the answer to my question. <laughs> <laughs> it's a math formulation that you're talking about, but I don't know what the problem is. Okay. Um, I think I, it's one or two more. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. Anyway, in harmonic functions, you can't specify a um, voltage at a point. You can specify a charge, but not a voltage. Um, so Maxwell, actually, and we were told this by Jeff Rao, um, Maxwell did something right, and he had a very special case that he analyzed correctly. Um, but it's in a very basic way, not general. Um, and it's, there's very little discussion of this. Um, oh, so I just wanted to, to defer a little further. I wanted, it's okay to speak ill of the dead if they're geniuses. So Feynman is, of course, one of the great geniuses of the 20th century. But I'd like to show you what he says that's really wrong. So he does a perfectly correct mathematical analysis of a succession of point, equal point charges in a row. You know, you, if you have an infinite array of equal point charges, it's not hard to compute the potential they generate. And he shows that that potential exponentially approaches the plane wave. That's true. Uh, the trouble is it doesn't tell you how the Faraday cage works. Um, so he says quite, well, he's a physicist, he says zero, he means exponentially close to zero. Right? He says, uh, the method we have just developed can be used to explain why electrostatic shielding is often just as good as with a solid metal sheet, except within a distance from the screen a few times the spacing of the screen wires, the fields inside a closed screen are zero. Well, I mean, even if you change zero to extraordinarily close to zero, that's not true. It's really not. Um, and in particular, well, the radius has to be finite, and moreover, there's nothing exponential in it at all. The answer is going to turn out to be this linear. So the shielding only, if you have an edge size, the shielding only gets twice as good. There's nothing exponential. Um, oh, I'm still not about to tell you. Uh, so this is... The point out of your distance from the screen is n times the screen space. Isn't the fall off exponentially? No. 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 All right. <laughs> You're, you're like Feynman, and like me, I assume that too. The whole trapezoidal analogy, I assume that, but it's not true. Um, so this is joint work with Chapman and Hewitt. Chapman is a great asymptotics person, and I'm going to show, show you some results from four different angles, and Chapman is the one who did the homogenized version. Okay, so finally, in the numeric picture, I'll show you a problem. Uh, the details aren't all written there, so let me write them. Um, so the basic model problem we'll consider consists of disks of finite radius at the roots of unity. So the rate, they're all the same radius, and the radius is R, and they're the n roots of unity. And now, so we want to find a harmonic function in the plane uh, minus those disks. And there are various formulations, but the simplest version is to imagine 
that you have a point charge forcing the system at some point z naught. So there's some point here, and now the boundary conditions are along all of these circles. You have to take a constant value, and it's the same constant on them all because they're electrically connected. That's one boundary condition. Um, I haven't written it there, so let me make sure I get it right. Another boundary condition is that you have to be asymptotic to log of z minus z naught as z goes to z naught. And then you still need one more. Um, you have to get it right at infinity, basically, to make sure that there's... That. So what happens is on each of these wires, there can be a non-zero charge. But we want to have a zero total charge on all the wires together. So that turns into the condition that u is equal to log of z plus little o of one as z goes to infinity. So you think you're on the sphere and you have to have total, total mass zero, or something that is going to be yeah. something there. That's right. Well, this is all okay. I think that's this problem. Okay. Okay. And you want to make it small in there. Well, we want to ask how small is it? How small that's is the question. I, I'm a bit confused by that. Yes. Yeah. The, the charge at infinity is the same sign yeah. as the charge at small minus. Uh, uh, they're not log one over monsi. Anything? Well, no. We'll figure out the sphere. This will be a negative number, and this will be a positive number. Um, if, if the k's weren't there, the, the potential would just be this. <laughs> I think, but well, I could be wrong. Okay. Where did Malik go? Right. So, so this is negative and that's positive. Yeah. So it would cancel. Yeah. <laughs> so um, the method we use, so we did numerical computations on this incredibly, we do not know of anyone in the history of the world who's ever done a computation of this problem. There must be some somewhere. Typhoon. What's that? I'm looking at Typhoon. Okay. I just heard it's a fabulous source of Maybe. concrete example. Yeah. Um, this is it's metal, not concrete. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we do is the same kind of thing that Malik does in his capacity computations. You um, you do the right clever expansions inside each of these. You put a uh, a pole, oh, sorry, a log term. For the electromagnetic case, you put a Heinkel function in each side of these. But for the static case, you put a log term. So associated with each of those is a log z z j hat term with an unknown constant. Uh, and then you have a lot of sample points on the boundaries, and you. Um, expand things in certain series. It's not a numerical part. I don't want to go into that. But you do the right expansions and you get geometric convergence. So I have one more question. Can R on the order of 1 over M? Not necessarily, no. It's uh, small. Well, it's going to be smaller than that. Right. Um, because, of course, intuitively, R could be infinitesimal or nearly infinitesimal. So it's going to be very small. No, it's your problem. We want to get the estimate of the corresponding phenomenon. What, what do you think R would be? Much smaller than 1 over Typical. Like 10 or 100? Well, I'll show you. It'll um, okay, so fine, let me show you some pictures. So uh, I drew these pictures. This is all started about six months ago. And you look at that and you think, for it. the Faraday game is fantastic. That's just what we hoped for, right? Here's the source. These are equipotential lines. And inside, nothing is happening, right? So happy. Um, and you can see R is 1 at point 1 and n is 12. Now let's um, shrink the wires. I think, I think they're really beautiful. Um, what was n when r was 21? n is 12 in all of these pictures. So in every case, I have 12 wires. But they're getting thin. And what you see is that as the wires get thinner, the effect goes away. And you know anyone in harmonic functions knows this has to happen. Uh, but of course, until you think about it, you don't realize. Uh, it's interesting how slowly it goes away. Even when the radius is one millionth, you still have a very noticeable effect. But it does depend on having a finite radius. Mm -hmm. 
Now let's look at the dependence on N. And this is really the scientifically more surprising one. Again, if you ultimately it's obvious, like everything, if you think about things right, they're always obvious in the end. But most of us don't think about this right until we're forced to. The dependence on N is only linear. So what does that mean? Here we have 10 wires. All these wires are the same radius. 10 wires, 20 wires, 40 wires. As you increase the number of wires, the field gets more nearly flat, more and more nearly zero. But that only happens in proportion to 1 over n. So you see, for example, when I go from 10 to 20 wires, the number of contour lines roughly cuts in half. So we're seeing a linear effect. When I go from 20 to 40 wires, again, it's sort of roughly cutting in half. So what we're seeing is that there's not an exponential effect, but a linear one. Which means that I would not want to be in the Museum of Science inside that case. I don't know why this guy survives. <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you want to see a bigger picture, um, here each curve corresponds to a different radius. So we have Radius 10 to the minus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then this axis is the number of wires. And then this axis is the field strength. So a good shielding means a small field, right? Notice in this whole picture, we're never getting better shielding than a factor of about 100. That's 10 to the minus 2. So everything above here, at least 1% of the field is leaking through. Even when you have 100 wires, that's a perfectly reasonable thing. So it's just not shielding in the exponential way. Have you compared this to the actual experiments that people make? We want to do that. We haven't yet. Um, it's a great idea. And it's, I think it could be a good undergraduate project, right? Because it's not as if we're trying to measure anything with incredible precision, right? It's great. Do you have a lab here that we do that? <laughs> well, there's another thing, which is that uh, real electron transverse or quantum wave functions are not classical point objects in specific locations. What does that do? I think that has nothing at all to the static case. Now, once we get into electrodynamics, there's a lot of questions. But here I'm just talking about electrostatics. Um, well, I mean, like, the sun. an electrostatic quantum hydrogen atom does not have a point proton and a point electron in a specific place. It has I agree. The, this is my just thought. But in order to find the effects you're looking for, you would need more than an undergraduate laboratory. <laughs> uh, I presume. No, I mean, this yeah. might be a major effect on uh, the ceiling. I mean, you know, the fact that electrons are smeared out might completely change everything. I have no idea. Well, I doubt it on the, on the scale of a lab, you know, where things are microscopic and wires are at least a micron thick. I kind of doubt it. <laughs> I, of course, in principle, there would be regimes. <laughs> um, but as I say, for the electromagnetic case, there's a lot more going on. I wouldn't make things about that. Um, okay, so. I, I mentioned I want to talk about this through four angles. The first was numerics. And so we have these nice, um, clean curves, which have a surprise in them that the shielding is weaker than expected. So any, any questions about that? OK. So um, the theorem will go by briefly, uh, because as I say, mathematically, this stuff isn't really that deep. Um, here's the theorem. Um, and let me say a word about the theorem. In the picture I drew, drew here, we were forced by at one charge. But for the theorem, we decided to make it a little more general. So we imagined that you have a disk of radius big R with an arbitrary harmonic function in there, which we take to be a size smaller than 1. And then we assume that this harmonic function is in the disk minus these n little disks of radius little r. And we ask, so an arbitrary harmonic function bounded by 1, satisfying a condition of the form u equals u naught on all of these. And u naught's between minus 1 and 1. Can we make a bound on the gradient of the origin? And so here's the bound. Um, it has the observed behavior. It says <coughs> logarithmic in the radius of the little wires, and then inverse linear in the number. And by, so that's sort of right, and that's sort of right. This isn't 
right? It should be better, it should be our minus one for our. We're not that interested in being very active. So um, we, we can prove a theorem that has the right behavior. This isn't a sharp constant. Um, and the proof is the only trick I know it's conformal maps, and that's the trick you need. But it's also greater than some other constants on one over n? Very good question. We haven't done that, and I think similarly. Well, that's what you're asserting when you say it's linear <laughs> You're absolutely right. You're totally right. If, if, if I want to prove that it's a bad effect, I, sh I should have the other theorem. That's right. But we didn't bother to do that. Um, if the referee asks us to do that, I guess we'll. <laughs> if you're the referee, <laughs> we're in trouble if you're the referee. <laughs> uh, I was doing this work on sabbatical in Switzerland, um, which probably explains why that image came to mind. Um, so anyway, the way we prove it is we take one segment... In Swiss cheese? Or? Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> you take one segment and then you take the nth power and you do this is a standard conformal mapping sort of trick. Um, and if you do that, it turns out to be surprisingly easy to make the estimates work. Um, take the nth power, and that turns you into a disk. There's a slit here, but it's a Neumann condition on both sides, so by the reflection principle, that goes away. Um, you do another small shift with a Mobius transformation, and pretty soon you've got the theorem you want. So uh, I won't say more about how that works. But anyway, it's a straightforward. Um, oh, but I should say a word about what we use it in. Um, so, in complex variables, we know that if you have a function of size 1 on the disk, then its derivative is given by Cauchy's estimate, um, and it's bounded by 1 also of the order. Now, what about a harmonic analog of that? Well, for a real harmonic function, there is an analog, but now it's horrible high instead of 1. And um, I don't know this stuff very well, but it's uh, this this is the book I happen to find that in. Does somebody here know what's the right reference for inequalities like this? So anyway, uh, there are analogous theorems, and it works in higher dimensions. So in fact, 4 over pi is just a ratio of a surface area to a volume of but I forget exactly what. So it works in any dimension. So that's the theorem. Can I just ask yeah. you about that? So you're using um, so the con you're computing the derivative at the corner at the corner on the boundary of your piece? No, in the middle. Well in the middle of the big disk, but when you take the slice out. Yes. Oh it's still um, we want the in this picture we want it in the middle of the whole thing. And um, you're alluding to this step. Uh, where we shift a little bit um, and it turned out that's a small adjustment and it does just a other questions? Sure. So at the end of my Swiss cheese, I came back to Oxford and um, got talking with Chapman and other people there. And you know, they, these are sort of real applied mathematicians. I'm a numerical And uh, what's the difference? What's the difference? It's a profound difference. Um, they're at bottom interested in modeling things, or at bottom interested in computing things that somebody else has modeled. Yeah. Uh, and they thought there must be some way to turn this discrete set of wires into a continuum. And it's beautiful. They, they did that. So here's the answer that they found. And uh, in the asymptotics business, it's never rigorous. So uh, there's no theorem here. But I'll, I'll show you with the experiments how true it really is. Um, so they figured that when, if you're away from the wires, it's clearly a smooth field. There must be some homogenized version of the boundary condition that gives essentially the right answer. And uh, the regime we're in is the wires are much smaller than 1 over m. So that is, most of the circle is gap, and then the wires are small. And the m is suitably large. And the idea is to find a boundary condition that Faraday cages implicitly imposed. And they did that, and it's really beautiful. Um, so you have a curve, this is your Faraday cage, which in fact is made of wires, but you can approximate very well what's going on by setting up a harmonic function problem with this boundary condition. So the boundary condition is that there's a jump in the normal derivative across the curve. 
which is equivalent to saying that you can think of a charge density along the curve. And that jump is equal to a parameter times the difference between the voltage there and the mean voltage on the curve. So this, this, these two equivalent statements are their condition. Let, let me talk about them from a few different angles. Um, imagine if A if alpha were infinity. That's the case of a perfect screen. So if alpha is infinity, then you know that the uh, u must be equal to a constant on the shell. So perfect screening corresponds basically to a solid shell. That's the limit where you really have constant voltage all along the curve, not just the line. On the other hand, if alpha is very small, then uh, there's sort of no constraint at all, and there's no screening at all. And their observation was that in between values, if you do high approximation solutions to this continuum problem. So we have our approximation of the Faraday cage, and then we have this condition of the charge density at each point along the contour is equal to this magic parameter alpha times the difference between the voltage and its mean value in the contour. And the parameter has the scaling in it, so you can see that um, there's an epsilon and an r. Epsilon is the um, size of the gaps, and r is the water in the gaps. That's the same noise as my screen. <laughs> Um, so, I, as I say, I won't be able to prove anything, but I'll show you pictures that are pretty good. Well, I don't quite understand, so the mu and the charge density. Yes, so um, you can forget charge density and think of the jump in the normal derivative. Oh. Okay? And it turns out that's equal to the proportional. So, well, let me say it another way. If alpha is zero, then the normal derivative doesn't jump. So that's a useless case where nothing happens. Well, you mean you have a harmonic function? Yes. But, so what, what, fun, what kind of function are we talking about? So we're talking about a harmonic function both inside and out oh. as satisfying this jump condition along the jump condition. Okay. Okay. And the pictures are pretty striking. So to make the pictures, what they do is do a similar numerical method that solves for a continuum boundary, but with this unusual boundary condition. Um, now, what have I got here? Okay, so the top is actual wires, 12 of them, of different radii. The bottom is what you get from a homogenized boundary condition, where you, you take a n equals 12 and r equals whatever it is, and you plug it into the formula for alpha and do the simulation. Uh, in this regime, it turns out uh, we're not close enough to the asymptotic, so it's, it doesn't exist there. It's something negative that should be positive. The asymptotics only holds for small enough r and epsilon. But in this regime, you can see the beautiful match. Of course, we're not capturing the behavior near the individual wires, but away from the wires, it's clearly doing the right thing. So does this second regime use approximation of the charge density by putting points of charge? No. So no points at all. So what it does is it, it plugs in, well, n is essentially the gap, so epsilon is equivalent to n. It plugs in your value of n and r to get this magic parameter alpha. And then it just uses that parameter alpha to solve a continuum. No wire in that left. So then this is telling you the asymptotic structure. I will really so. Yeah, we believe that. Yeah. Uh, oh, so that was so that's what asymptotic people do. They apply the actual. Yeah. Other problem that describes just the asymptotic too. Uh, yeah. And Chapman is one of the world's best. Well, he's he makes it look very. Um, the, the method they use is called multiple scales analysis, where I forget what I know. Three. Yeah, so you have um, three regimes. There's an inner region, which is on the scale of the 
where the wires have a finite thickness, as it were. Then there's an in-between region where the wires look infinitesimal, but the gaps between the, between the wires are significant. And then there's a large region where uh, all, both of those look invisible and it looks just like a cage. And how these things work is that each of these regions, you form a solution that in some asymptotic sense, uh, that it makes sense. But then you uh, force them to match. So you match this to this and this to this. And then from that matching comes a solution. This is a, a very well-developed technique that I'm not an expert. For example, there's a, the book that Chapman recommends is like the working in coal, but there are very books on this. Um, so this was the dependence on R. A similar figure now is the dependence on N. So now we fixed the radius of the wires, and we're taking n equals 10, 20, 40, 10, 20, 40. So again, here you have the actual discrete problem, and then here you have the continuum of approximation. Well, you can't fix the radius and let n become too large. That's true. If n gets too large, you have a solid shape. Yeah. But, um, so what do you mean? I thought you were letting n become large. Uh, not too large. Well, uh, okay, not too large. <laughs> Okay, R is always smaller than the one over N. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? If, if you were to actually look at the limit where it becomes a solid shell, yes. presumably alpha gets infinite or something like that? Yes, in fact, uh, yes, I guess it does. Yeah, it's so that's answer. how you know that's... But I'm, I'm not sure the formula has that happen at exactly the right point, because okay. the formula is based on an asymptotic assumption that the wires are thinner, much thinner than that. The formula doesn't capture that exactly. But I mean, I when I first saw these pictures, they just amazed me. They're so beautiful, aren't they? You, you can see the individual wires do individual things, but the global effect is very convincing. Um, and here are uh, current question about just yeah. go back to the So then, then there was this notion that uh, from Feynman, if you go a few length scales away from the uh, the particular effects, if you looked at the difference between the actual numerical computation and the homogenized value yeah. conditions, are they uh, exponentially small? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you've, uh, that's the orange line coming up. Yes, sir. Sorry. Um, so, yes, this is sort of exponentially close to that, but they're not exponentially close to zero. That's the point. So, well, you get your lower bounds. <laughs> So you get your lower bound in, in, in the asymptotic problem. Are you in oh, yes. on the order of one over n? The asymptotic problem. Do we get a lower bound? Yeah, I know that the gradient at zero is at least. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, one over on the order of one over n. I'm sure that's true, but we haven't. Uh, I mean, the asymptotic problem. You also don't know that. Well, we haven't thought, we haven't tried to prove it. Um, I presume one could, but we haven't. But we I guess one could. I don't know what would be. Uh, again, just comparing the pictures. So these are actual curves from actual Faraday cage wires, whereas this is a homogenized approximation. Now, it's the same as what I showed you before. The different curves are different radii, and this axis is the number of wires, and then this is the field strength. So a good, good screening is down. And remember, the asymptotics is asymptotic in the limit of a lot of wires and a small radius. So it's sort of this upper right part of the picture where the model is supposed to be correct, and you can see it sure it is. Um, so we have this very convincing match of the asymptotics to the conversion. <laughs> okay, any questions on that? So the final thing I wanted to get back to is the trapezoidal rule, and Andrew already alluded to that. So um, what's going on? We have this original intuition that the trapezoidal rule is exponentially accurate. Is, is that somehow related to this problem? And well, yes, it is. So let me run you through the, the thinking here. Um, it is true that a small charge disk, you know, you have a little wire. Is that approximately a point charge? Yes. I mean, away from the wire, it looks like a point charge. I mean, we've sort of known that since Newton, the gravity of Gauss, I guess. 
we all know that away from a little region, things uh, can be well approximated. Um, and it's certainly true that the trapezoidal rule is exponentially convergent for analytic functions. So, you know, why didn't this give us exponent exponential screening? Why doesn't the Faraday case have screening? And the answer is, the point charges have the wrong strengths. Of the wrong what? Strengths. So you can get exponential screening with point charges, sure. But a Faraday cage doesn't give you the right charges. It gives you a little bit too, it doesn't move the charges around enough. Um, so the Faraday cage does provide an exponentially good approximation, but sadly not to the zero field, which is what you'd like, but rather to this homogenized field. Um, how do we know that? Because we, it's just a trapezoid rule approximation to something. And, um, um, so these are now three things to compare. The top is the actual numerical computation with 10, 20, or 40 wires. And in the middle, the field strength is 0.023, which is not very close to zero. Here, you have the homogenized problem, except rather than the continuum, I've sampled that continuum at points. So I've, these are point charges, and their strengths are determined by solving this homogenized problem. So this is a trapezoidal rule approximation to the homogenized problem. Right? So the trapezoidal rule is exponentially convergent. Therefore, we know that this picture is exponentially close to the picture you would get from the homogenized problem. I don't actually know whether that's exponentially close to this or some other. So, the true cage gives you rather weak shielding in the middle. If you discretize the homogenized problem, you get almost the same, rather weak shielding in the middle. But then at the bottom, you see what you would get if, if you let, if you imagine a continuous conductor, a truly a, a shell, and then sample it. So here, we've taken 10, 20, and 40 samples of the charge distribution for a true conducting shell. And now you see the screening is fantastic. So now we have 10 to the minus 12, and it's, it's converging exponentially. So the uh, gradient here is 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 12. So you can get exponentially good screening with point charges. Unfortunately, the Faraday case doesn't give you the right charges. I hope I know what this last problem is. Okay, so in the last problem, I did a true conducting shell, a metal, and then I sampled that the solution at points. What does that mean? It means I, um, I, I computed the charge distribution on that shell, and then I just looked at its value here, and its value here, and its value here, and I multiplied each by a little bit of arc length. So I put a point charge there, and a point charge there, and a point charge there. And the amount of point charge here was equal to the charge that should have been in this little arc. Um, it's like taking the wrong alpha. It's like taking the wrong alpha. Yeah, or, uh, or the right yeah. alpha. <laughs> this is alpha equals infinity as sampled in points, whereas what the Faraday case actually does is a finite alpha. Well, I'm a bit confused about this. You, have to see, you still have this point outside the region. Yes. In your original problem, the charge was only at that point. You used it to get a potential energy on the boundary. But now you're saying something else. You have to have yeah. a charge on the yeah. boundary. And I'm sorry, you've made me realize that I never mentioned at the beginning of the talk the physics of how these things work. So let me mention that. Um, here's how cases work. You have your metal, and you have a charge out here, blah, whatever. So what happens is that that charge induces a charge distribution on this conducting surface. So um, if, you know, this electrons here would repel electrons here, and that repulsion happens until they're in equilibrium. And when they're in equilibrium, the charge distribution along here is just what it takes to cancel that on the inside. So the forcing charge induces a charge distribution here, whose total will be zero, but locally will be non -zero. So that's what we're showing here. Um, on each of, here's a non-zero charge. The cage has a total charge of zero, but the individual dot is non-zero. Okay. 
Um, so we now think, at least for this electrostatic DT case, we understand everything. Actually, 3D is the same, so no surprises in 3D. That's still just linear and immense size. All of these arguments, I think, go through, although our paper doesn't discuss that. Um, and this, uh, I'm sorry, who was the quad? You're the quadrature guy, right? Well, what is so, the key problem? So there are points on a sphere? Or no, a no. We're imagining wire. 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 Yeah. Points would be weaker, um, but we're imagining. So it's something like a square grid wire mesh on a sphere? Possible. Yeah, but it doesn't, you don't need regularity. So uniform spacing is important. So um, also on the sphere, it will be, the shielding will only improve linearly at the three minutes. Trust me. <laughs> um, and by the way, the way I think of the, uh, I actually think of these harmonic problems as random walks. You think of ground in motion. How hard is it for a particle to get through a gap? That's something. Um, the dynamic case is much different, and I don't want to make claims kind about of it at all. I'll just make an observation of it. So, this was all electrostatic, but what if you make it a time dependent problem? We're thinking of electromagnetic waves now, right? And that's what your microwave oven is really working with. Uh, so, the first thing you might try is change Laplace's equation to the Helmholtz equation. So, this would correspond to a uniform oscillation in time with a frequency of k. And you could say this maybe relates to Maxwell's equations, maybe to the electric field component of Maxwell's equations. If you just do a similar computation, you quickly find that interesting resonances could occur. Right? So uh, here we happen to pick a frequency near a resonant frequency of a circular drum, and of course we're getting a lot of response. So uh, that argument suggests that the shielding will only get worse in the dynamic case. On the other hand, there's a lot else going on for dynamics. Uh, the most important would be uh, electromagnetic induction. So if you have varied fields, of course, they generate responses in wires. And this, of course, is a much more complicated problem. But weirdly, there's more literature on this. And um, I'm fairly confident that the world in general doesn't understand the electrostatic case. But weirdly, it may be that they understand the electrostatic the uh, Newman case. Um, there is a literature on that talking about uh, transmission through gradients. So our paper doesn't discuss that at all, and I think that's all I want to say. So thank you.